Hello, hello! Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains! <laughs> and today we're going to be cackling like madmen. A lot. Because it's time for more mad science. And this time, it's helicopters. Five helicopters. That were clearly just mad science experiments. The Focke Wolf FW61. You know, if you think about it, a helicopter in and of itself is kind of a mad science experiment. Yeah, okay guys, here's what we're gonna do. Instead of doing like a normal plane that we already know works and is safe, how about we put the prop on top of the thing and hope that it stays level and doesn't kill us all. It'll be fine, I promise. To be fair, helicopters have worked really well and are very, very good at what they are for. And the reason I put the 61 on the list is that, well, it's considered the first practical, functional helicopter, and as a result, one of the oddest. It may seem like low-hanging fruit to talk about the very first helicopter in terms of being a mad science experiment, but like I already explained, helicopters are kind of nuts. And this thing first flew on the 26th of June, 1936. Professor Henrik Focke had already been working with autogyros for a while, which in and of themselves are a pretty interesting concept, but he felt they were very limited. To compensate for that, he thought that they should have a powered top rotor. Autogyros don't power the top rotors, they are strictly autorotational. So he wanted to create, well, a helicopter, and started work in 1932, and worked their way up to a free-flying model in 1934, which proved that the concept could indeed work. So at least they tested it before building a full-size version. On the 9th of February 1935, Fokker received an order for the building of a prototype which was designated as the FW-61. A single radial engine drove twin rotors that were set on tubular steel outriggers to the left and right of the fuselage. It itself was based on the fuselage of the training aircraft, the Fokker Wolf FW-44. Each of the main rotors had three articulated and tapered blades that were driven by the engine through gears and shafts. Longitudinal and directional control was achieved by using a cyclic pitch and asymmetric rotor shift. And since it was using two rotors, well, they didn't have to worry about the torque reaction causing the aircraft to spin. The rotors spun in two different directions, they counter-rotated. It's the same way the modern day Chinook works. You probably already noticed it has a propeller in the front, but that was purely for the sake of the motor they were using. Airflow was crucial with that type of engine in order to keep it from overheating. The tunnel prop in the front actually provided negligible thrust. It wasn't meant to actually pull it along like an airplane. And they only ever made two of them, but the tech was later adapted to create the Fokker Agelli's FA-223 Drach, which means dragon. They only ever managed to produce 20 of those, but it was the first helicopter to actually attain production status. They would have made more, except that Allied bombing destroyed the factory, so, you know, World War II and all that. The Bell Boeing V-22 Osprey. Okay, I concede that some of you are probably already writing comments and hold off. I know this isn't technically a total helicopter of sorts. It does have the functionality of a conventional helicopter, but this would be more properly defined as a tilt rotor. What's the difference, you ask? Well, it's in the name. The Osprey's two rotors can tilt in midair, allowing it to transition from a fairly typical helicopter setup into flying like a regular plane. The program that created these things officially commenced in 1981, and the contract was awarded to a partnership between Bell and Boeing. The Osprey first flew on the 19th of March, 1989, though it was not introduced until the 13th of June, 2007. Due to its, um, well, rather unique characteristics, and the fact that tilt rotors haven't seen a tremendous amount of use, most of the tech that went into it was fairly new and unheard of, and there were a lot of challenges to overcome. Several prototypes crashed. It actually happened often enough to be rather alarming. And there was a tremendous amount of criticism during development because as time dragged on, things got more and more expensive. 
because this is a military project, and that's what happens, okay? I don't know what anyone expected me to say. The development budget was actually first set at two and a half billion in 1986. <laughs> okay. They later increased it to a projected 30 billion in 1988, which is a little bit more reasonable, but by 2008, 27 billion dollars had been spent, and another 27.2 billion was required for planned production numbers. And between 2008 and 2011, the V-22's estimated lifetime cost grew by 61%, which was mostly for maintenance and supporting of these craft. The press, including Time Magazine, criticized the V-22 heavily, condemning it as unsafe, overpriced, and inadequate. But the Marines, in particular, backed the project heavily, finding the potential use of something like the Osprey way too beneficial to pass up. Yeah, there were a lot, a lot of mishaps, and the tech was a nightmare to get working, no question. But often these kinds of newer concepts do wind up like that. Mad science requires sacrifice, people! They call them mad. Look at them now. They can fly any way they want. We live in a society. The Air Force and the Navy also wound up with them as well, and the Japanese Self-Defense Force actually got a hold of a few they wanted in May of 2020. Yes, the V-22 Osprey was a colossal nightmare when it came to developing it. But it does seem to work, and frankly, I think the technology is really cool. Maybe some of you think we spend too much money here on our military, and I can understand that point. But if my taxes make something this awesome, I can't complain about that. That's where I stand, okay? The Sikorsky CH-54 Tarhi. Is that helicopter broken? It's missing a piece. There's no fuselage. I mean, I guess there is. Did it get damaged? No, 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 no. That's the way it's supposed to look. Now, admittedly, for anyone familiar with helicopters, you probably already know exactly what this thing is. So you're not at all surprised by its rather bizarre appearance. Because, frankly, that was the whole point. The Tarhi is an American twin-engine heavy lift helicopter designed for the United States Army. The Tarhi is not the first version of what could be called a sky crane. Sikorsky had already been messing around with that since at least the 1950s. The Tarhi just happens to be one of the most famous examples, which is why I put it on the list. In fact, the civilian model of the CH-54, the S-64, is just called sky crane. And that's literally what they are. They're not designed to carry anything internally in a cargo bay. Instead, they literally pick things up and put them down. That's what they do. That's literally their whole point. And the Tarhi can lift a lot. Like, a lot. Look, here's a picture of it carrying two Yui's. I repeat, two Yui's. Oh yeah, here's one picking up a tank, cause that's normal. They were used heavily during the Vietnam War, typically to provide logistical support, and of course, heavy transport activities. They would often be used to reposition artillery pieces, or airlift things like bulldozers, or patrol boats. These things lifted whatever they wanted to, though eventually the army would see a need for something even better. An arrival, the Chinook, which I already mentioned, actually started supplementing its role. But it wasn't the end of the Tari story. The Army National Guard still used them as late as 1993, and even once they were retired from that role, they were sold off to many civilian companies. Because, again, they can lift a tremendous amount and are very easy to fly. It's just a very useful setup for a lot of different applications. Some are in museums, but many are still in use, doing a fantastic job picking things up and putting them down. Zemil V-12, comrade. If you couldn't figure it out by my initial joke, this thing is a Soviet aircraft. At face value, it doesn't look that crazy. Especially since we already talked about the FW-61, it's a similar contra-rotating propeller setup. You don't understand. Perhaps there may be an issue of scale in the pictures I'm showing you, because this thing is the largest helicopter that has ever been built. Because of course the Soviets did that, of course the Soviets did that. What other country on this planet would bother making something that big just because they could? Okay, besides us. Okay, yeah, probably. Look, it's a superpower thing, shut up! Design studies for a giant helicopter, comrade. 
so were started at the mill OKB in 1959. The reason why they wanted something so large is, frankly, they need something huge to lift their ICBMs, the intercontinental ballistic missiles they had. Nothing they had at the time could really do this, well, without a runway, and the V-12 was meant to fix that problem. At first they wanted to use only one propeller, but design limitations forced the twin rotor setup instead. The airframe itself actually is pretty conventional, but largely due to how, well, large it is, there were significant control issues that had to be overcome. To keep the control forces felt by the pilots to an absolute minimum, the control system actually has three distinct stages. Stage one is the direct mechanical control from pilot input forces, and those are fed to a second stage, an intermediate power control system with low-powered hydraulic boosters. And those transfer commands to stage three, high-powered rapid action control actuators, which are at the main gearboxes and operate the swash plates directly. It worked, but yo. Its first official test flight actually resulted in a bit of a hop, not an actual flight, due to oscillations caused by the control problems. But the second flight actually went better, and it set several records in terms of lifting capacity. When they worked, they actually outperformed their design specifications, and a lot of the records they set still stand today, because, well, no one's ever bothered to make a helicopter this big since then. Seeing it in action was visually impressive, but weirdly, it, um didn't get put into service at all. The Soviet Air Force did not accept the helicopter. Why? It was doing exactly what they wanted. In fact, it was performing better. What happened? Well, that had to do with other technologies outpacing the development of this thing. See, it was meant to carry their missiles, remember? It was meant for their rapid deployment. But by the point the V-12 was ready, the missile's range had largely increased. There wasn't a reason to move them around anymore. So, something this big and massive just didn't really need to be used. It naturally would have been very expensive to maintain, and if there's nothing large and heavy enough that needed to be lifted to necessitate the use of this thing, then what was the point of it? Which is rather sad, actually, because besides its complex and irritating production, the end result did actually function. The Common K-Max. What in the heck? I, yo, those rotors are really trippy, and they're so close together, and this thing is so skinny. What is going on? The K-Max was developed as a medium lift helicopter during the 1980s and the 1990s, building on the work of the German aeronautical engineer Anton Flettner. It first flew on December 23rd, 1991. And believe it or not, these things are still in production. They were meant for both civilian and military applications. Technically speaking, it is a counter-rotating setup, where both rotors turn the opposite direction, but usually, like with something like, again, the Chinook, that's the third time I've brought that thing up, the rotors aren't set right next to each other. Literally. And yet, in this case, they are. This is not even the only helicopter that does it this way. The rotors are timed in such a way that they pass by without hitting each other. Which sounds so bizarre because of how close they get, but it does work. This type of setup is often called a sync rotor, due to, well, the need for the rotors to always be in sync. Sometimes they're called intermeshing rotors. Like I said, it's just trippy and nuts, and you know, every time I see it, I still can't believe that these things actually work, but they do. The K-Max, which is often called an aerial truck, is the world's first helicopter specifically designed, tested, and certified for repetitive external lift operations and vertical reference flight. Other helicopters that were used for these tasks were actually adapted from general purpose helicopters. They weren't built that way from the ground up. The K-Max was, and it can lift almost twice as much as a Huey. And it's perplexing and uh, profile, shall we say, the skinniness well, that's to give the pilot a good view of the load. The windows of this thing are actually bulgy, so it's very easy to look down and check on what the helicopter's carrying. So far, they've actually been pretty successful by anyone who's given them a shot. Even the Marines have tested them out. They actually tested an unmanned drone version of the craft, too. Like I said, they're not exactly unique these days. There are other helicopters with this setup, but this one looks the weirdest to me. And I just had to talk about one of these, 
Because seriously, those rotors are in spinning distance. They look like they're about to careen into themselves at any waking moment. And yet they do not. Incredible. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Some Dude 267 Orange Glass, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsum 131-232, Mr. Black Rose, Josh Johnson, the Metal for Life Guy, Anzac A1, Arthur Roy, DM Trumpets Foon, Tommy Rossini, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Joshua Long, Alaric Jaspers, Brian, Jack Carson, Terrero Videos, Major Klutz, Hayden Negro, Ohio Trucker 1, and Master of None. Till next time, this is Darkness, individual fond farewell.